we're going to start with scripture and prayer. Thank you. Let's start with Jeremiah 29, 7. It writes, Also seek the peace and prosperity, shalom, of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Next in Matthew 5, 9, it writes, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Finally, in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 7. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I, if I have the gift of prophecy, and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Let's close our eyes and uh, bow our heads in prayer. Gracious and uh, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to learn more about the intersection of faith and science. And I just pray for everyone that's here in person and everyone that's watching online that they would be able to experience your love. And Lord, as we read in the past Bible reading, uh, the Israelites are prayed to ask for the land that they're in exile in. And I just pray that for all of us, no matter uh, or wherever you placed us, that uh, you would be able to bring peace and prosperity uh, to that place. And uh, no matter where we are in life, I just pray that you would help all of us be able to prosper and be a blessing to others. And uh, may your peace uh, that passes all understanding uh, be with us and guide us. And especially in this culture where sometimes faith and science are seen as a complete opposite. So we pray that we would be able to uh, show your love to other people on a daily basis and uh, be able to bring uh, peace and prosperity wherever we go. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And uh, Professor Barry Ritchie will uh, moderate this panel along with Lily Sue and CISO Messia. Okay, well, welcome back. And it's good to see folks are still here. Um, uh, as Ben said, we wanna look at uh, science and peace and, and talk about the relationship there. And so to uh, have that discussion, we also have a, a, a special video that you hear about in just a second, but to, uh, to share the conversation with me, I'm, I'm pleased to join uh, a new friend and an old friend in the sense of we've known each other a while. Uh, um, and so uh, uh, I'd like to have them introduce themselves to you and tell you, first of all, uh, where they were born and then uh, something about their life in Christ, and then we'll uh, uh, then come back to Lily, who will uh, introduce and share this video. So Lily, why don't we start with you? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Lily Shea, Dr. Lily Shea. I'm an associate professor of economics and public policy here at ASU. I'm delighted to be here. I'm an environmental economist. I study how environmental protection can be um, realized cost effectively. Um, and I really enjoyed um, today's earlier session that Catherine, um, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe um, had um, and where she talked about solutions and not that there is solution aversion, it seems, um, surrounding global climate change. And um, I, I hope as a Christian scholar, as a Christian economist, that I will be part of the solution. Um, but Barry, to answer your question, where was I born and my, um, my walk with Christ? I was born in Taipei, Taiwan. Um, I'm Taiwanese American. I came when I was a wee little girl. Um, my parents were pursuing graduate degrees at University of New Mexico. And that was where I met Jesus. Um, there were these missionaries um, at the University of New Mexico, um, where our family, family was part of a local Baptist church. 
I am now um, a Presbyterian Christian, but I um, am born, uh, or excuse me, I'm baptized Southern Baptist. So really, um, I'm non-denominational. Here at um, the Phoenix Valley, I'm part of Redemption Tempe, and also very engaged in the Graduate Student Fellowship um, through InterVarsity. Um, and so um, that's a little bit about myself. Terrific, and I look forward to coming back there. All right, CISO. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here, being part of this great uh, event. My name is Ciso Macia. I am a emeritus professor at ASU Polytechnic. I started working at ASU in 1990, worked here for five years, and then moved to the Polytechnic campus. I was born in Cuba. I lived there the first 14 years of my life. And then my parents wanted to get me out of the country because if you turn 15, you have to enter like a military reserve. So there were many young people leaving Cuba at that age. I left by myself from Cuba to Spain. I was there for three months. Then I came to the United States. And about a year later, my parents came and we moved to Texas. I, when I was in Texas, I received a mechanical engineering education, and I came here to Arizona to work in a field called fluidics, uh, similar to pneumatics for Honeywell. Well, I worked for them for several years, and then uh, I became self-employed, and in 1990, I started working at ASU. From a spiritual point of view, I have always been a Catholic, but when I was 20, something very special happened. There is a retreat, if we could call it that way. And I attended one of those retreats called the Crucillo Movement. And something happened in that quiet weekend that I really felt what Jesus had done for me. And my life changed. Unfortunately, I made the mistake of going to a community in college where I did not have a lot of a spiritual support. And that treasure that I had received at the Crucillo, little by little, kind of went away. So through God's grace, I came back to a more active role in the church, and I pursued the diaconate in the Catholic Church. In 2012, I was ordained a deacon, and I served as a deacon in my local church. I serve in a church that is in Queen Creek, where half the community is Spanish speaking, the rest is English speaking. So being able to speak Spanish is very, very nice. Okay, so uh, it's, it's interesting to talk about peace. I, you know, I, I think one of the reasons that we seek peace uh, is that uh, all of the scientific virtue, virtues are much easier to practice when you're in a situation of peace. And so seeking peace uh, helps facilitate the uh, enjoyment uh, of the other virtues. Virtues. There's this passage in Micah uh, where uh, uh, the, Micah is, the, the prophet is talking about in the latter days, uh, uh, all of them, every man will sit under his own vine and his own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid anymore. And for us to think about that vision as, a, as the vision of what peace means uh, is uh, uh, to see it as something that would be coming in the future. But the whole thing about seeking peace now is, again, to facilitate the practice of those virtues. And, and so, Lily, do you want to talk about, uh, set up this, this video with uh, Hiroshi, uh, who was going to be here, but some things uh, uh, took place that, that made it impossible for him to join us. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we were so struck by this video that we wanted to show, uh, we wanted to continue at least to, to feature him in that way. So Lily, do you want to set that up? Or? Sure. Um, so I went to church with Professor um, to uh, Hitoshi Muroyama um, over uh, back in the San Francisco Bay Area, First Pres Presbyterian Church of Berkeley. And as an undergraduate student at First Pres Berkeley, I was struck by a Christian scientist. 
amazing. He's a, a you know, a Hitoshi is um, a theoretical physicist, um, and um, and yet he was um, every Sunday at church um, in the pews listening to our pastor, uh, Mark Laberton, who is now um, the president of Fuller Seminary. Um, and um, I was just struck by um, his humility, um, Hitoshi's humility. Later on, years later, I learned in 2014, he gave a speech at the UN titled Science and Peace. And, and I think it's a very worthwhile um, speech for us to, um, to watch today and to reflect um, on as well. I myself play a small part in getting young people excited about science. Several years ago, the University of Tokyo asked me to start an international science institute in Tokyo to attract young and ambitious scientists from around the world. I've raised five basic questions I've always wondered about from my childhood. How did the universe begin? What is it made of? What is its fate? What are its basic laws? And why do we exist in it? These questions resonated well with scientists from all cultures. Lily, what, what would you take from that um, brief uh, clip we saw there? Sure. So as a social scientist, economist, I'm not able to address the first four questions, but I do have some things to say about the fifth question about um, why do we exist? Um, and um, to begin, I would think about it, um, I, I would say, in two different, um, two different ways. One, first, why do we exist? I think it's ultimately first about God's primary calling. And, and this is a primary call for all of us, regardless whether we're scientists, social scientists, or um, an engineer, doctor, a custodian. And that primary call is to love God with all our heart, mind, and soul. And secondly, and importantly, to love our neighbors as ourselves. And that's the primary call, and that is why we exist. But as a scientist, a social scientist, to be exact, I also have a vocational call, and many of you do too. And a lot, and a lot of students here are still discovering what that vocation is. Um, for me personally, I believe that in my vocational call as an environmental economist and public policy scholar, I bring shalom in what I study, what I do. And um, just briefly, what I study is how um, markets and governments at times fail. We live in a fallen world and we know that as Christians or, um, or even non-Christians know that this is a fallen world. And so in my research, I study how then, how to understand what that failure may mean for environmental protection and sustainability and sustainable development to be um, exact. And I study how, and in my research, I've published um, widely in this area uh, on corporate environmentalism, for example, how we could, how corporations could leverage the market um, to be part of the solution in a decentralized way, but with government um, setting some of the rules and accountability. Um, and um, so in my research, I bring shalom, but first and foremost, my primary call is to love God and to love my neighbor. And my neighbor at the university are students, fellow professors, and also support staff as well, um, and everyone else you know, who, who are part of the university. Um, and um, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Cesar, so I wanted you to, to talk a little bit about uh, this project that uh, you're involved with. And um, I, I want you to listen very carefully to his description and what's involved here. So uh, please, see. So would you please tell us about it? Back in the year 2000, the first part of the, the year 2000, 2001, a benefactor gave some money to ASU Polytechnic to go and visit a university in Costa Rica called Earth University. This university goes around South and Central America, now the entire world. They bring students to this uh, university 
and they teach them everything they can teach them about agriculture. The hope is that they will come back to where they came from and they will be agents of transformation. And what is kind of interesting is that many of the students at that university either come from rich landowners or students that have a lot of leadership quality. So for many of those students, this is the first time that they eat together with someone that is from totally different class. Well, while I was uh, there, I was exposed to aquaponics. Aquaponics is when you bring together fish and vegetables. It is similar to hydroponics, but in hydroponics, you introduce nutrients into the water. In aquaponics, you have fish, and the waste of the fish is what feeds the plant. The ammonia produced by the fish is uh, converted into nitrites and nitrates from the naturally occurring bacteria. And this, that is the way it works. Now, I need to tell you that I am not a chemical engineer, so I had to do a lot of learning about this system. I started doing this work uh, on my own. Now I am uh, working with some ASU students that are very passionate about sustainability. First slide is going to show you the early system that I work with. So, to your right, you will see the vegetables. You will see that you have a tray that is floating on the water. That water goes back to the fish. Then the water from the bottom of the tank goes into a particle filter which keeps all the solids from moving forward. Once a week, you can drain that filter and you can use that very rich water, rich nutrient water to water conventional plants. And then you go into another container where you basically have a lot of surface area, a lot of plastic. That surface surface area is a home for the bacteria, and the bacteria again transforms the ammonia into nitrites and nitrates. And then you pump that water back to the vegetables. So you have a closed circle cycle that is continually processing the water. This process is being used commercially because one of the benefits that it has is that it doesn't use as much water as conventional agriculture. Now, you probably look at that and say, there are a lot of fascinating processes taking place there, which it, are ideal for teaching. So in the early years that I was involved with this, that was my goal. But obviously, it is not going to solve the problems in a poor neighborhood in Mexico. Here is the fruits of some of that uh, some of that system. What you see there is lettuce. You see that the lettuce is uh, pretty appealing. So like I said, that system really is not feasible for a poor neighborhood in Mexico. So we started exploring how can we simplify that system. And this is what we have right now. Imagine a pond that is uh, four feet wide, eight feet long, about two feet deep. And again, you have a liner because you don't want to lose the water to percolation. Now, I need to tell you that any research should be done in teams. I don't care how much you know about a particular discipline, when you work in teams, the results is always better. I need to tell you that when we started this work, we had a partition. But we did not envision that when you put water, 
the soil settles and basically it left a gap between the fish and the vegetables. And even though we were feeding the fish, they certainly liked the roots of those plants much better. <laughs> so that was not a good experiment. So working in a team, someone came up with the idea of a housing. Imagine a structure that has a screen around of it. Now there is no possibility for the fish to get out. And best of all, when you are ready to get some fish, guess what you need to do? All you need to do is to pull that, uh, that housing and you can pick the fish that you want to, to eat that day. Okay. So this is the system that we are trying to develop. We are trying to find out what vegetables work best. And, and notice that there are no pumps. So the idea is that if you have one of these in your, in your house, in the morning and in the afternoon, you would take a five-gallon bucket and you would take the water from one end to the other because you need to move the water. In liquids, diffusion is very slow, so it has to be done. The other thing that we are doing is we are exploring a different type of fish. If you go to any aquaponics setup, you will find that the choice fish is tilapia. Tilapia is very tolerant to different water conditions. It grows very fast, but it's got a problem. It cannot tolerate cold temperatures. And you may say, well, Arizona is the ideal place. Mexico is the, the ideal place, but you and I know that we can have several consecutive days when it gets very cold. And if you don't have a, a backup plan, you will lose the fish. So we are exploring the use of bluegill as a fish that, would, uh, that, would, that we can tolerate a big range of temperatures. This is what uh, one of the early prototypes looks like. You can see the cage, that white PVC structure that can be taken out, and that's where the fish reside. Now, I mentioned to you that one of the things that I do is that I serve as a deacon in a church in Queen Creek. And many of the parishioners are people that have come from Mexico. I have had the opportunity of meeting them and seeing their situation. One in particular has left his family in Mexico, and he's here working and sending money to the family. I reflect on raising a family. Raising a family is a challenge. It's a wonderful challenge, but it's a challenge. If it's a challenge when the father and the mother are trying to do it together, imagine how much of a challenge it is when you have a mother doing it by herself. This particular man said to me, in Mexico, I can either feed my family or close my family. I cannot do both. Now, this man doesn't have an education, so he's a common laborer. So interacting with people like that has motivated me to try to come up with a solution. Maybe if this man was aware of something like this and it was working, he could be right now with his family seeing his children grow. He could be with his family having an impact on his family rather than just sending money to, to Mexico. So even though we are at the beginning, that is what we're trying to do. The reason I asked you to listen to closely is remember the introduction when, when CISO told you what he did? He a, was a fluidics professor. Notice how we were, begin, we, we were talking about whether bluegill would be a better fish. Uh, that's not normally in a fluidics textbook. So when someone asks you whether being a biologist 
a, a fluidicist, if, there, if, a, if there's such a word, a physicist. How can you promote peace as a physicist or whatever? Please do not think that means that you are only a physicist. Uh, a physicist is not your entire, the, the entire sum of the things that God can call you to do. Um, you know, one of the uh, uh, questions that, that uh, Lily sent around earlier was to ask what our favorite Bible verses is. And that's always tough because there's just so many. Um, but for a scientist, I really think the best one is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the start of the story. We were, I was talking with some students at lunch. That's your story. That's the start of your story. Now, a physicist is, is what I happen to, to be called to do at some time, but that is not the only thing I am. Um, a dear friend of mine once told me, uh, as you know, I'm getting close to retirement or whatever, he said, you cannot retire from what you are. Uh, the, there are elements of what I am that I will never leave behind. Uh, I don't see science and faith as different facets. Science is something I do. Faith is what I am. Uh, and so uh, there, there can't be a real conflict for me there. Um, so Lily, as, as you looked at this, because mm -hmm. you, you talked about promoting flourishing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as an economist, you know, as, as you look at this, uh, what's the impression you get, first of all, uh, from uh, Lily, the environmental economist. What's your impression of CISO's project there? Well, I, I think your project sounds very sustainable. Um, and um, I think one aspect of it that I really appreciate is how you are thinking about who benefits and and um, and thinking about you know kind of across socioeconomics backgrounds and whatnot, um, and when we think about technology, which is a product of science, oftentimes, um, and we think about cost effectiveness, which um, primarily economists um, are concerned about, um, we forget at times to think about how um, our technologies um, are helping certain communities or not. Um, are they um, benefiting the rich more than the poor? Um, and so I think uh, in uh, in ec economics and certainly in public policy research these days, we're thinking a lot about that, about environmental justice um, and how we can, as scientists, both social scientists and scientists, um, in a systematic way, um, really think about kind of like the distribution of um, how technologies affect um, livelihoods and to promote sustainable development. And I think that's exactly what you're doing. And I'm very impressed by it and would love to learn more about it. And I also love what um, Barry just um, also touched upon how um, we're not just scientists or engineer of one particular type or an economist of a particular type, but we have that primary calling, uh, primary call by God um, and, um, and we're uh, made in his image, right? Um, so just well, some of my thoughts. Yeah, well, let me add then, uh, as, as, a, as a called follower of Jesus yes. Christ, how, what, what is your reaction to this project? Does it promote shalom? Does it promote peace? Uh, me? Yes. For you, yes. Definitely, it promotes um, shalom, shalom. And I, especially when, um, when CISO, you were saying how um, working in a team um, and work, you know, in a, in in collaboration is when we um, we really kind of push forward science, um, both science, you know, science and traditional kind of physical, natural science, but social science as well. Um, and so, in, indeed, it promotes um, peace and your um, target population. And the way, the fact that you're thinking about um, peacemaking kind of broadly um, also promotes peace. So um, I'm being told it's time to go to Q&A. Um, let's see, where was I going there? Um, you know, I think the, the, the thing that, well, going back to what I said a second ago about, about seeing Genesis 1-1 as the start of your story, 
uh, here is the book of Ciso. <laughs> it, it's somewhere between Jude and Revelation, uh, the book of Ciso. And to see our lives as part of that story uh, is to see ourselves much, much bigger than just a scientist, much, much bigger than a person who has a particular specialty. And so uh, in uh, Hitoshi, and my, and my apologies for saying the name wrong earlier, in Hitoshi's view of himself, it is, he, had, he is seeing himself far bigger than being a theoretical physicist. He's seeing himself first and foremost as a follower of Christ. And some of the skills that God has given him are theoretical physics. Mm -hmm. Some of the skills that CISO has been given are in fluidics, but his calling is much, much greater than that. Uh, and so as, uh, as we learn and mature in uh, the pursuit of our vocation, our calling to a particular set that uh, our skills do, we need to remember that our true calling, mm -hmm. the true story, is much, much bigger than that. Uh, we are first and foremost, uh, uh, as, as the Lutheran liturgy, baptismal liturgy says, we are marked with the cross. We have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen. Uh, our <laughs> calling is much, much bigger than being a physics professor or being a fluidics professor or being an, uh, an economics professor. Much, much bigger than that. So, um, uh, uh, Cecil, would you like to, to comment on, on Lily's reaction to your, uh, your project? Thank you for those very nice uh, comments. I like to say that uh, we are collaborators with Christ. And God can use us. I know that there are certain times in, in our careers, in our life, when we are just barely surviving. Maybe before you defend a dissertation. But there comes a point in life, in life where you realize that you have been given some gifts, some opportunities. And I think it's very important to recognize that those come from God. It's really easy to say, well, I, I work hard at school. But in reality, all comes from God. If you ask a child who buys your food, that child would say, my parents. Who takes you to school? My parents. But many times, as we start getting older, we begin to move our focus from God and it is ourselves. So the more we realize that we have been given tremendous opportunities, the more we are motivated to share that with those that for some reason or the other have not been given those gifts. And that is uh, one of the things that encourages me to pursue this project. So, so when do you retire from that? This war is not uh, from me. Some of you may know Chuck Backus. Mm -hmm. He was the founding uh, dean at ASU Polytechnic. His wife said that he was flunking retirement. <laughs> yeah. And my wife said the same thing about me. I, I enjoy what I'm doing, and hopefully I will be able to do it until the Lord closes the door. Well, as someone who is just in some ways, you know, beginning to flourish in my careers, I'm inspired by both of you and many others, many of the giants um, um, which, whose shoulders I stand. Um, and so thank you for these words. Yeah, so, so Lily, what is your favorite verse? I mean, you were the one who posed that to us and you've given us a chance to think about it. Yeah. And I, I, I don't think that you wouldn't have an answer to that question. <laughs> so what is your favorite verse? Thank you, Barry. Um, so my favorite passage or verse is uh, Psalm 23. And I, I think because it is a verse for me as a child of God, as a daughter, as a wife and mother and teacher, 
professor. So it covers all dimensions. Um, first of all, it reminds me that God is my shepherd. I am not in charge. Um, and also the fact that he's walking with me and setting a table in front of my enemies, before my enemies. Um, and certainly in this world, there are challenges, right? Especially if we're, whether we're scholars or, you know, whatever we do, whatever our vocation in walking with God, there will be others who are against us. And so this, you know, Psalm 23 reminds me that I'm at that table for a reason. God has given me a voice. So, yeah, that's. Okay, say so. There is a verse in Psalm 95. And it says, uh, do not become stubborn like your father did in the wilderness at Meribah and Massa, when they challenge me, even though they have seen all my works. So here are the people living from Israel. They had seen some wonderful things, and now they were becoming stubborn. They were questioning God. And I think of uh, King Solomon, who was given the gift of wisdom, and somehow he lost that. At the end of the story, he didn't have the wisdom that he had in the beginning. And it kind of opens my eye that regardless what gift the Lord gives to you, you need to protect it, you need to nurture it. So that, uh, that verse it's an eye-opener for me. Mm -hmm. So those verses, it's interesting, both came from the Old Testament, so I, I think that's surprising. Uh, and, and actually, I, I'm actually pleased at that. Um, the interesting thing, too, though, is to see your lives as part of that story that mm -hmm. began with Genesis 1-1. And again, you're in the book of Lily, you're in the book of Ciso, and, <laughs> and, and lots of good verses in there. Um, but you also know how the story ends. The book that follows the book of Ciso and the book of Lily uh, tells us something about how the story ends. How does that motivate you to promote shalom, to promote mm. peace, Lily? Wow, that's pretty profound. Um, I think it allows me to, to be courageous, to be fearless, if you will, because I know that the story doesn't end here. And so I'm able to step uh, forward in the classroom when I'm, you know, promoting shalom through um, economics um, or public policy, um, and also in my interactions with even enemies, even those who are in opposition. Um, and so knowing that this is an eternal life, not just this one moment in time when one might get that, you know, accolade or external validation. But as Christians, we're at that nexus of God's creation, his power, and human, you know, achievement. We know that what we have with God is eternal. What we have on earth is fleeting. Yeah. See, so a, uh, another Catholic deacon uh, posed a question. Uh, how does your being a deacon influence your secular work? Um, you know, it, you know, let me just stop right there and, and let you uh, speak to that. It calls me to, to a higher standard. And I'm a, a little bit embarrassed about this story, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to share it. Several months before I was ordained a deacon, I went to buy a tire, and the understanding of the warranty was incorrect. So the tire broke, and I came back to ask for a new tire, and uh, my understanding was not the same as the understanding of this salesman. I am typically a very easygoing fellow, but my interaction was not, uh, not something that I am very proud of. So I decided to come back and apologize, but many times I have ideas and they remain ideas. I didn't do it. Well, I, be, I was ordained a deacon, and I was asked to do a rosary in the other side of town, 
this man's wife had passed away. So I go to the funeral home. I give my condolences to the husband, to the daughter, to one of the sons, and to the other son, and I turn around. And when I turn around and start walking away, guess what? One of the men with this man that I, that I had had a negative interaction with, I immediately turn around and apologize. And to me, that is one of the ways in which God manifests itself. We have uh, challenges. We are called to walk, uh, despite whether it's easy or difficult. So um, all of us, whether we are deacon or not, we are called to be ambassadors of Christ. And the way that we interact communicates that situation. So it's, it's been great talking with you. I mean, part of the, the, the Hebrew word in shalom is, speaks to completeness and, and to being, being fulfilled and, and, and things of, in, in that word family, the, the three consonants and, and the vowel points can dance around and do different things. But it speaks to completeness. And so what I hope that you, you've glimpsed here in both Lily and um, CISO's testimonies, because they, they are testimonies, uh, living testimonies, uh, what, what you've seen is that putting the practice of promoting peace is part of living peace, part of promoting peace around you to taking the whole person, not just the economist, not just the fluidicist, not just whatever particular discipline you have chosen to special in, but to bring all of your gifts and all of your talents because God lays a claim on all of those. Those are all gifts from God. Uh, again, your book is somewhere between Jude and Revelation. Uh, it's being written today. Uh, you know how the story ends. You know what the next book is. And so... Uh, I think it, the, the examples that our, our two friends here have given us should inspire us to, to follow their example of using their whole being, all the gifts that God has given them, including the, the gifts of the mind that they've been particularly blessed with uh, to promote shalom, uh, the reconciliation of the entire world that... Uh, is spoken of in the last chapter. And so uh, will you join me in uh, uh, giving them a hand? We'll